stand up for yourself And I'll back you up Cause problems don't solve themselves I'll tell you what Instead of would or could I think you should Draw a line in the sand and stand your ground It's for your own good Hello, my name is Roy Poyan, and I want to welcome you to another edition of The Voice of Families and Addiction. I'm excited about today, and I guess it's kind of the way I woke up. Um, I got a call from my doctor, and they told me that from my blood lab, everything's fine. As I got into the car to come down to the TV studio today, uh, the public radio station was playing themes from James Bond. So I kind of started to feel like a 007 in a way. And then when I got here, I announced that we're going to start the new podcast orientation to discuss with you, the families and the medical community, that we can do something different. And we believe it's going to make a difference. But first, we kind of need to understand where are we today and where are we going? Welcome to the voice of families in addiction. I want to first start out by suggesting that um, we, we know a lot about a lot of different pieces. And we have done some incredible people, I mean just incredible people, have put together uh, what is currently identified as our delivery system of services and care models. And it's just a fantastic expression of love and caring as we see our families and their family members suffering with substance use disorder disease. And we've identified enough now and empirically proven through studies of just great works, uh, different areas of mental health, addiction services and recovery treatments, uh, and medicine. And we've started to combine those in a way that makes for a universal system of care. And the payers, those that are responsible for paying for these services, have oriented themselves in their understanding of what these types of delivery systems can provide. And they're starting to get a, a maximization of the results. But what we're, what we're not seeing much of is the inclusion of families. And um, that's concerning. Uh, we, we know that this person came from a family. Often I'll ask a treatment center, so what, what do you do with the families? And it's not just the treatment center. I see it in medicine with the doctors and hospitals and in mental health centers too, and, and as well as community agencies. And, and, and the, the common kind of like response is, well, their families aren't involved with them. They'll make the statement, well, they don't really have any family. And, and my first step back is, you know, are, are, you, are you serious when you say that? I mean, do you expect me to accept that? Of course they have a family. Where do you think they came from? Everybody has a family. It might be an elective family. It might be a, a family that uh, is, is more of a relative. But we all have a family. I mean, we came from a family. Our society is made up of a community. A community is made up of families. It's a gathering of families that create a community. So when we say that we have a disease and we say that we have treatment protocols, and we say that we have a delivery system, and we have these different, like the ER experience, detox, uh, IOP, residential, uh, partial hospitalization, aftercare programs, mental health for dual diagnoses, and medicine for comorbidities. Uh, all of these are, are pieces. We didn't say anything about the family. And yet, when we're done with all these pieces, that's who we're going to give them back to. So we start to question ourselves, is this system truly, I don't like to use the word holistic because it, it takes you off in a whole, because it, it takes you off in a whole bunch of different directions. I, I'm patient-centered care because that takes us back to, we're just handling, you know, Allison and her addiction. And, and the thought is, okay, so what about the family? And then the, the retort back is, we've already told you, Roy, we don't do anything with the family. I scratch my head and I think, well, well, why is that? I mean, why are we leaving the family out? Hmm. Could it have something to do with the fact that 
Medicare, and I'm not blaming them, but I am suggesting that it, it does make a difference. Medicare has not created a billing code for working with the families. Oh, so the suggestion might be that a lot of this is driven by money first. No, no, we've got way too many people. Social workers, these people love what they do. They love their patients, and they really do. And um, God bless them for that, the sharing of their gifts and everything that we do as a society and a community. It's a beautiful expression uh, of, of, of what is a society. But when you get right down to it, money has a lot to do with strategy. Money has a lot to do with structure. Money has a lot to do with implementation. So it's kind of like, let's not kid ourselves. <laughs> money has a lot to do with what gets delivered. And it's certainly today, right now, the way that the system is set up, has a lot to do with whether or not we're including the families. I don't think anybody would argue that when a mother, father, a sibling, a uh, brother, sister, have something that's helpful and wise and proven uh, through the sciences to say, in a moment of where we're not even around, influencing this person as they're dealing with their cravings and their drug addiction, uh, that there's a value there, that this person is armed or knowledgeable or empowered with knowledge so that they can make that suggestive statement. And then you, you, you might say, well, how far do you carry that? It's unlimited how far you carry that. That's up to the family. You see, we really don't belong managing the person as much as the person belongs in their family environment and it being nurtured. This is a disease. If they, were, if, if they were to sit there and say, gee, you know, I have asthma, I don't think you'd find the family sitting there saying, well, then you're, you're out of here. But then again, that's not why the family said you're out of here. It's because of what they did, their behavior. It's not the fact that they had the disease, it's the behavior that is caused by the disease that kind of creates this disruption in the family system mm -hmm. It's a disruption in the relationships known as the family dynamic. So how can we reorient ourselves? Well, I'll be honest with you. More than likely, you're not going to like what I had to say about this in the beginning. But hopefully over the next three parts of introducing this family substance use disorder chronic disease management model, uh, you'll start to see the wisdom of starting there. What we're going to do is we're going to start with the money. The money is driving a lot of this. And for that reason, we need to get real as family members and start to see ourselves as consumers. Let's say you had a cash register and in your cash register drawer, when you hit the button and the drawer pops out, you've got your hundreds, you've got your fifties, twenties, tens, and, and fives and ones. And you have to pull out for the services that you're going to use and pay for them. Because let's face it, that's the only way any of this gets done. So we're going to start to get real with that. I have a, um, a, a board here that we're going to kind of use for a couple of points of discussion to bring home the messaging. And we're going to start with the fact is there's a drug involved here. Okay, it, it, it hasn't become a virus yet. It hasn't become, not that this is a virus, but it hasn't become a disease yet. Uh, it's just a drug. And when the drug is introduced to the body, it creates an effect on the body. The, the effect can be seen as cardiac, dental, gastrointestinal, immunological, muscular, skeletal, neurological, pulmonary. I just went through all the different floors of a medical arts building that's attached to the hospital. In fact, I just went through a hospital too. The medicine side, okay? So we have amphetamine, cocaine, hallucinogens, heroin, inhalants, opioids, sedatives, and, and what, what, what they kind of call as where spice is, it's a synthetic. And, and we see H-bomb and spice and a, and a couple of other products there too. Um, so when we're starting to look at the drugs and we're starting to look at how it impacts the body, that's the reality of what's going on here. It doesn't get any more complicated than that. There are drugs and it's impacting the body. Okay, we got that. And it's all wrapped around money first. First there's money, then there's services. 
First, there's money, then somebody was paid to create a strategy. First, there's money, somebody created a strategy and put structure to support the strategy. First, there's money, somebody created a structure, excuse me, a strategy, a structure, and then procedures and processes in order to support the structure, in order to achieve the strategy, in order that that money have a return on its investment. Okay. I, I, once again, it's not that I can apologize for it. I don't think it's bad. I think it's good. I think it's a good system when it's designed correctly. Now, how did we get into the system the way it's designed today? Well, we discussed that in, a, in another episode, but the fact is we didn't really design this system in order to address addiction. We had these elements out there and we quickly said, oh gosh, he's coming off the battlefield. Quickly, gather, gather you know, some water, gather some clean bandages, you know, boil some water process. And then uh, let's start to get him prepped and moved back from the battlefield and, and, and closer maybe to a mass unit and then from a mass unit into a hospital. Okay, that's kind of what we're doing here. We're taking the elements that were in our society as they existed. We did have mental health hospitals and services. We did have medicine. And we did have a limited beginning thought back in the 60s of what would be required for treatment. We continued to use those. We made each of those elements better. But that doesn't mean this was the best way to design this. Had we been able to push all this off the table, watch it hit the floor, and then sit there and go down and pick up off the floor, we want this on the table. And then go down and pick up the floor off the floor. We, we want this with mental health, but we want it like overlapping, like a Venn diagram, uh, a part of it overlapping medicine. And then we want to take this, which is treatment centers and addictive services and all their protocols and empirically proven uh, studies. And we want to put that down. And once again, we want it to overlap both mental health and medicine. It is addiction treatment services. And in a Venn diagram, it has a third overlap so now in the middle, we have what? Well, the way we designed it, the patient, the person. But, but we didn't include the family, okay? So we only have part of the situation. And you might sit there and say, well, Roy, why do you say part of the situation? Well, be, because what we will see is that when families are engaged, they're able to do more for the whole system of delivery then if they're eliminated, they might even be counter to what's being productively done in the system. So to leave them on the sidelines and to think, well, it doesn't really matter that we left the families out of the, the equation. Uh, I, would, I would argue that it does matter because they could be a negative or a positive, but they're never going to be neutral. They're never not going to have an opinion. They're going to have an opinion. The question is, is it an informed opinion is it part of a planned process of the system or do we just kind of leave them on their own and hope that they say or do the right things? Well, we've already seen because that's the way we're doing it. That's not working, okay? So as we start to take a look at what needs to be done, well, first that needs to be done is when this person comes out of you know, the environment that they're in, we're going to assess them. And, and, and so you start to say, okay, well, now we're getting into this, you know, tri-system, right? Correct. And in this tri-system, can we numerically quantify that assessment? Absolutely, we can. And we do. And with that, we can then put it into a disease management model. Given that they meet the criteria and they're eligible, they could be enrolled in a disease management model. And in which case, the money can then be used and accountable for performance measures known as outcomes. And, and that, that's a critical aspect of what is um, not really yet able to be performed in a standardized way. You know, we've got a lot of mom and pop, which is very good, they're beautiful, uh, treatment centers, but they don't have the funding and the sophistication to really run true Clinical, uh, clinical protocols that are based with outcomes, measurements, and metrics, and the proper type of data collection tool. So we want to look at data collection tools as it relates to the plan of treatment. And here's a new 
area that we're going to explore today and in the next three parts. Variance and intervention management. Wow, what did I just say? Well, I'll, I'll be honest with you. That's a very big uh, part of this. When you can start to take metrics and measure this person's performance on a timeline where you're kind of gauging how are you doing, you're on a plan of treatment. That's the timeline, okay? And by that I mean um, it's January of 2024. This person is enrolled in the program, and we start to begin our disease management model, uh, and I'll describe that in just a minute. And all of a sudden, uh, we start to apply a plan of treatment as a part of that process. The plan of treatment is a known set of tasks and follow-ups and, 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 and possibly um, therapies that are applied. Because we've practiced this before, we've studied it, and we've empirically proven its success, we have a very high degree of confidence. If this person follows this trend, this, uh, this train of thought or this treatment plan, then these are the likelihoods of them being successful. Well, that's great. Um, how do you manage that? Well, when we use the word management, we're basically saying we monitor it. We come in and we check to make sure, are you doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing? It, do, are you applying fidelity? Are you applying comp, uh, are you, are, are you applying comp uh, kind of a compliance in your, in your behaviors? towards your drug treatments, MAT, um, OUD, and, and, and MOUD. If, if, if that's the case, then you know we, we have every expectation you should be doing okay. Unless something's changed with you and we didn't move the treatment plan so that it is basically, you think of the treatment plan as being in a math equation, the denominator, okay? And kind of think of the person as being the numerator, the above. You know, the, the, the denominator supports what's above it. So with that in mind, the, the, the treatment plan, if, if the treatment plan doesn't move, but the person does, then they don't have a basis to stand on. You know, they're kind of outside the, uh, the, the support that the treatment plan can provide. And so you sit there and you think, well, what are you talking about? I mean, well, in real terms, what we're talking about is that they are not going to their NA meeting. Oh, well, that was part of the treatment plan. Okay, so we don't have a, a compliance here, do we? No, we don't. Uh, oh, by the way, empirically proven inside of this protocol, we already know that in self-care, which is stage one of three stages approaching a relapse, that that's one of the indicators. So it could be numerically measured. Are they just missing a couple? Have they dropped out completely? Uh, or are they not participating while they're there? These are all critical factors to the idea of uh, what's going on with them in terms of their support and learning and, and growth through their NA or AA meetings. Well, okay, good. Uh, but we also noticed another indicator in self-care, which is stage one. Uh, we noticed that they're not eating well. Well, <laughs> once again, to what degree? What, what, you know, if you were to stage it, mild, moderate, or severe, now give it a numeric. So you sit there and you think, okay, so we can measure that, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if they're not eating well, are they having you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner? And what, what, what's the plate code on that? I mean, are they, are they properly putting the right things on the plate? Um, or are they not eating well? Or are they skipping meals? In other words, is their nutrition down? If we, did, if we ran a blood test, would we see that their nutrition is down? That's where the medical comes involved. So we can monitor them numerically through a blood test regarding their nutrition and how their body is doing. That impacts the relapse. We know this already, okay? So now this is where this disease management model in month, um, you know, like 36 after they have finished the IOP, which is normally a time that nobody's even talking to this person. But because there's a disease management model that's been enrolled in, for the next five years, he will be or she will be properly managed as a disease. So where does this all kind of fall into place? Well, let me take a minute to describe to you what the model looks like for disease management in substance use disorders. 
And it starts out with kind of, well, it, not kind of, but it starts out with an admission. And we're, we're doing an intake with the person. And we establish a relationship with them. Uh, we complete a physical and an environmental review. Then we look at acuity and determine, you know, kind of a SWOT, you know, what's their strength, weaknesses, and, um, you know, and, and how exactly are they aware of their threats. Um, and then we move into, we establish a care plan from that. Okay, so now they have a diagnosis for medical, for mental health, and for addiction. They also have a staging for each of those diagnoses. And they also have a plan of treatment for each of those diagnoses. You see how this gets complicated, which is why a structured strategic management model is a real asset. We're not doing that right now. <laughs> we could be, but we weren't, we weren't doing it because originally it wasn't set up that way. And so then what we're sitting there saying, okay, well, if we're gonna do the disease management model and we're gonna put it into play, isn't this a completely different way of, of orienting our healthcare system? Because if you're going to do that, that's a behemoth. I mean, nobody comes walking in and says, hey, I've got a great idea. Let's start doing it this way. It just doesn't happen. But then again, it didn't happen for HIV AIDS either. And that community, the gay community, got together and they brought in a lot of talent from a lot of different fields. And now HIV is treated in the same way that diabetes is treated, and they have every expectation for a long-term quality life. Fact is, back in like the early 80s, it was a death sentence, and so is addiction today. So in a sense, what did they do that we could learn from? They got organized, and throughout their whole community, they, they, they got involved. And that's what we're asking of families. You need to be engaged and involved in this. In fact, in order for you to get to the established care plan inside this disease management model, you have to have as one of the criteria, your family. It's almost that they need to create a declaration of commitment, meaning they are 100% in on this. So in other words, if you're a family that's sitting here saying, you know what, Jack's on his own and um, we love him, we care about him and, and when he gets better, huh, good luck, uh, there's, we'll, we'll be happy to, you know, have, have dinners with him and include him to the holiday. But until that happens, you know, we're, we're not available. We have to protect ourselves. I understand that. I mean, and a lot of, an awful lot of families handle it that way. They handle it that way because they don't have any other coping skills in order to handle it that way. Well, that's why we created the Family Solution Final Learning Series, but we've already started to discuss that. Today, we're talking about a disease management model for families dealing with substance use disorder. The entire family has this disease now. Therefore, the chronic disease management model handles the entire family. So what does that mean? <laughs> well, it means that the family needs to be educated in the same way that this person is. It may be that based on their existing conditions of the mother, the father, their sisters and brothers, that they have medical conditions also. They may have mental health conditions. They may have a minor degree or a major degree of addictions for themselves. So if we're going to sit there and say, oh, gee whiz, Roy, I mean, it's enough for us to middle, you know, Donna. And you're telling us that we now have to include, we're not gonna do this. Well, of course you're not gonna do it. There's no billable for it. There's no services for that. There's no coordination between these three different entities. <laughs> There's no way you're going to do that, which means you're in a lot of trouble as a family. And until you get into a position or a program such as a disease management model for families, then you're going to always be suffering in this way. And it's, over time, it's just going to get worse. It doesn't typically get better. Sometimes it finds a norm but often it, it gets worse in other ways. So now we're back to the, um, to the disease management model for the families dealing with substance use disorders. And we're moving from the, from the uh, establishing a, a plan of care. Well, one of the things that we're gonna do is we're going to get a status, a health status of them. So we're gonna break apart their, their whole like being and we're going to look at the idea that 
from a clinical a utilization of financial and a satisfaction. Okay? That's where the that's where the plan of treatment drives. Okay, it's it's typically those four characteristics. And every aspect of this has a metric, meaning it can be measured. If it can be measured, we can monitor it. We can manage it. You can't manage and monitor something you can't measure. I mean, you can, but it's very difficult. So therefore, we have to have the ability to not just measure and monitor, but to manage it, meaning it's got to go somewhere. This data has to go somewhere. So the management model is actually orienting itself with two entities, actually three. The first entity is a primary care doctor is overseeing what these data points are telling that, per, telling that physician. And the second part, it's a home health care agency. Oh, I thought they just treated grandparents. No, not, not really. Um, see, on staff with a home health agency, and they have billing codes for all of their services, so anything they do can be reimbursed. Uh, they go into the home. Well, are you suggesting, Roy, that this is something that's going to be managed in the home? Well, I'm, I'm suggesting that the education is going to take place there, the behavior is going to get changed there, and uh, the support is going to be there, and the metric tools, and the data collection will be, oh, yeah, I guess I am talking about it being measured in the home. Would you rather them come to the doctor's office and lie to you? Because I'll tell you what, when a home health care nurse comes into your home, she sees or he sees everything about your life. If you sit there and say, because a part of self-care is being the first part of relapse, so it's a variance monitoring that we do during each visit. And the visits might be at once every four to six months. So they walk in and they say, so Jack, how are you doing with eating? How's your nutrition? And he's looking kind of thin and pale. And Jack says, I'm doing great. And the nurse sits there and thinks, something's wrong here because she's smart. This is what they do for a living. She goes to the refrigerator. He's got a can of, uh, of Coors Light. He's got mustard, mayonnaise, and, and something that used to be, you know, ham. Uh, and, and she comes back to him and says, you know, I don't, I don't believe you. And so for that reason, I'm going to recommend on my review here today that we're having a problem with nutrition with you and your lack of fidelity and, and compliance to taking care of yourself is, it, it, we're gonna note that as part of you know, our review. Um, how are you doing with your employment? Um, well, I'm doing good, I show up a lot. Well, he's lying, okay? And the fact is the employer has reported in that you know, Jack, Jack is not showing up on time and he's not performing well at work. So that goes into the metric. So now we've got two indicators, and then we might say, so are you showing up to your NA meetings? And Jack says, well, you know, when I can, I can't catch the bus, and you know, and I got mad at this one person. I mean, it was just really mean what she said to me. And so it's like, okay, well, you get a three instead of a one. You know, it's, not, it's starting to add up like you're moving to the second phase of relapse, which is mental, and we already know this. So let's intervene now while it's less expensive. So that, that information gets sent over to the primary care. The primary care looks at it and says, according to the disease management model, we need to order a nutritionist. <clears throat> oh, well, they're on staff at that home health agency. That's what they do. So he orders a, cons a consult and the nutritionist comes in, meets with, meets with him and says, okay, um, it looks like you, you're not getting the idea that you know, broccoli's a good thing and uh, you, should, you should have a meat, uh, a starch, and, and a vegetable, and um, milk's good, okay, in, instead of your sugary, uh, let's start to do maybe club sodas or some kind of um, uh, seltzer water, if you like that, and, and, and we'll start to reorient you and I'll, I'll continue to monitor you from a nutrition standpoint. And then they also, because this is a disease management model, get in touch with the peer-to-peer -peer coach. And now you've got the nutritionist saying, hey, why don't you take them down to the grocery store and show them how to buy groceries? And when you get back, why don't you show them how to cook the stuff? So his plate looks the way it should look when he sits down at the table. And so then the mental health person comes in and says, hey, Jack, you know, Dr. So-and-so had ordered a mental health visit. They're on staff at a home health agency. 
it's now taking place in the home. Are you seeing kind of the wisdom of this model now? And we're in their environment. We're meeting them in their reality. We're helping to make behavioral changes with them and, and then having them demonstrate back, and it's measurable, their knowledge. Did you get what I said? Do you understand it? Can you repeat it back to me? And their ability, their self-care skill. Now, Jack, can you demonstrate for me physically the things that we just talked about? Because they're going to measure that too. That's pretty cool. Okay, let's face it. What we just said is that we're going to measure their ability to demonstrate back to us their knowledge on self-care because that's where we are in this particular variance intervention. Well, you might say, well, Roy, it's not a variance yet. He didn't relapse. <laughs> yeah, he actually did. He relapsed in the first phase, which is called self-care relapse. And that's actually identified by SAMHSA, and it's empirically proven that that's a relapse. Okay, mental health is the next, and then physical is the next. They're all three are relapses. So if we can catch them in the relapse of self-care, it's much less expensive, and it's much less disruptive to this person's life and the family's life and the people that are in this person's life. So when we're sitting there saying, we want you to repeat back to us, and we're going to numerically score it, can you kind of see the sphere that us doing that just impacted? We now know, numerically speaking, exactly where he is on his knowledge of something that's critical for him, okay? And then meaning, why are you not going to your NA meeting? And then we've measured that. And then we've asked them to demonstrate back to us the skill. Can you show me what you're going to do in order to make sure that you attend? Or can you show me what you're going to do when you're at the meeting and you basically push yourself in order to participate in the meeting, because that's when the meeting becomes most fruitful for you. Trust me, none of these things are being done today, and yet this makes perfect sense. And the fact that we're in their life, in their home, sitting on the couch with a professional that's sitting there measuring it, and that's what this professional does all year long. They do it in other kind of cases, but they are professionals at doing this. They're professionals in educating. A home health care nurse does all of this. And then they have other services inside the home health care agency. Now, we first started out by saying, follow the money, follow the clinical. Where the two meet, there's a decision that needs to be made. That's just a hardcore reality. And there's a billing code for it, too. So are there billing codes for everything that I just mentioned? Yes. Does that mean there's an incentive for a a physician to do this type of program? Yes, and there could be built on added um, bonuses for their performance, kind of uh, uh, utilization, clinical utilization and financial review of the patient's performance and, and then some um, kind of a reward system would be based in allocating more money to the physician that performs well. Now, that doesn't mean if they don't perform well, they don't make much money. It just means they make more money if they do perform well. Either way, they get reimbursed for exactly what they did at a healthy reimbursement rate, not some cut rate that makes it undesirable for them to participate. These people have to be paid, but we're taking the money that we would have paid on a relapse and we're proportionately kind of presenting it to the outcomes and the measurements and the clinical tools of what's being done here in this model. So now we're going to go down to a, a different aspect, and we're going to look at the linear aspect of the drug, the medical condition, the diagnostic, the plan of treatment, the assessment, reassessment, reassessment, reassessment over a five-year period. So we've done all of these things on a timeline. We're on a clinical pathway for this disease management model. Things are going well. A disease management pathway is designed on time. As time goes by, what gets done clinically to the plan of treatment, to the reassessments, and to the diagnoses uh, or changes in diagnoses. Stages might change. They go from mild, moderate to severe. It might be that they went backwards uh, to, from a severe to a mild or gone from a mild to a severe. 
So the diagnosis needs to be on, on target. And then utilization. Does the utilization of services, all the services, match the plan of treatment? Oh, well, we forgot to do that. <laughs> okay. I hope if you're going to forget to do something in your plan of treatment, it's not a big one. Because if it is, you, number one, you don't have fidelity to the plan of treatment. Number two, the numbers are going to show it. That's the beauty of this monitoring. Wherever you don't do something that you should have done, it's going to come out in the numbers. And you're going to be able to kind of like, in a forensic way, look back into this whole case and say, this is where we went wrong. This is why we didn't get the outcomes we wanted. Right now, none of this is done. So it's going to get a little confusing, OK? We've got a payer that is basically looking at clinical utilization, financial, and satisfaction. We've got a provider in addiction, medical, mental health, community services, and, and faith programs. And then we've got a family um, that, you know, is starting to learn through hopefully one of the models that are out there. Uh, certainly the Family Solution Finder Learning Series. Uh, Hazelton has an excellent program. SMART has an excellent program for families to learn from. And there'll be more, trust me. This topic will grow. And, but it's under a chronic disease management structure, okay? And it's related to the patient. The thing right now is we're not involving the community and we're not involving the family. That's their environment. Let's face it. We're only kind of as good as our environment when we're vulnerable. When we're stronger, these things become less of an influencing factor. But when we're weak, and these people for the first five years are, I'm not going to call them weak, but you know, they're not fully back to their new normal. So if that's the case, then what are we in the business of? Well, we've got this structure, and it's going to be performing well, and as long as they're, you know, they're, they're adhering. Uh, and we're making changes as, as needed. We're in the variance intervention management business, okay? Because we now have them on board and we're measuring how they're doing and what they're doing. We're now taking a look at the fact that, you know, as a variance on this pathway, um, what should we be doing clinically, mental health and medical uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, you know, the, the person's profile, an intervention may be required. We have to be ready for that. And, and more than likely, several times, an intervention will be required. So it's based off of the diagnosis, which is based off of, you know, meaning mild, moderate, severe, that we already know that they're addicted to heroin. And with that in mind, the assessment, and the reassessment, and the reassessment. And when something spikes, or starts to change, and we start to see it, through our monitoring of the three stages of relapse, uh, numerically we're starting to see that you know, the treatment algorithm needs to change because they've changed. So clinical utilization of financial all need to shift. And we can do that because we are managing this person and their outcomes. So the plan of care really is the driver in all of this. And, and then our ability to monitor and reassess is, is our management or, you know, really are hands-on. But the true management is how we respond to the variance, how we use an intervention. An intervention in this case might be, you know, we did diagnose early on when he came on board that he had been using heroin for 17 years. And because of our protocol in this disease management model, we asked for a, um, a cardiac uh, assessment. Oh, gee, we didn't get that. Um, oh, well, now we're paying for it, okay? Because we allowed this person to go forward. Uh, we didn't make a full commitment to the program, or it got dropped off, off the line. And um, now we're having to re, kind of redo and go back and get that assessment done. Oh, gosh, we found out he has a cardiac valve problem. And that's affecting him physically, which affects him mentally, which weakens his ability to uh, respond to the self-care um, uh, theories, uh, not theories, but practices. And, and, and so you can kind of see how things start to cascade in a downward way. We didn't handle that, that third element, medicine, correctly. Uh, the same could be true for mental health. You know, we, we didn't properly diagnose the stage of schizophrenia. We were treating him as though he was a mild, when really he was a moderate moving into severe. 
Okay, well, that, that has implications. <laughs> Let's face it, we know that. That's our job in the clinical world. Well, who's going to hold you accountable? The disease management holds everybody accountable. That's its strategy. That's its structure. Well, who's going to hold the disease management accountable? You, the family, okay? Not the payer, not the clinicians, okay? Not your treatment center, because they're probably not involved. They're only, they're only episodic when, when needed. Okay, not the mental health. They're, they're continuous in terms of they continue their plan of treatment. So you sit there and you think, well, what do we know? <laughs> oh, this is where we are. We need for you to make a commitment. And we need for you to sit there and say, we're in, Roy. Okay, we're in. We see the advantages of a family, substance use disorders, disease management model, disease management model, and we want to be in and tell us to. We're not going to cafeteria style this as we move down towards this cash register and say, oh, take that off my tray. I don't like peaches, you know. Oh, take that off my tray. I don't like the fact that I have to get him down in order to do another reassessment, you know, or have have, you know, make sure that he's at home when the nurse shows up, you know, I don't want to have to do all that. It's too, it's too cumbersome. You don't have that choice. You're either in this or you're not. If you're not, then get out of the program. Okay. We're not here to carry your weight. You're here to carry your weight. I kind of thought that's what you were saying in the beginning. You wanted to do, you told us, you're ready to make a full declaration of committing yourself to the disease management model over the next five years because you know it's going to make a difference. And we will then be able to do more with you. So with that in mind, who's monitoring? Who's watching the hen house? Get right down to it, the family. If they're in and they're participating and, and they are all in, both feet, and, and, and I think most families would want to be there. Um, getting there sometimes is a challenge, and sometimes it might require some family therapy and structure, strategy, Bowen family therapy in structure or strategic uh, um, or multi-level dimensional family therapy. Uh, these are two recommended by uh, SAMHSA for families. Uh, would probably be a very healthy thing. So now we're in the, in the identity that this is truly a disease management model and variance management is an active part of this and I'll start to flip it, but no. That's for part two. And in part two, we'll further discuss the disease management model designed for families dealing with substance use disorders. The name of this disease management model, and I've saved to the end, the name is the abacus. The abacus is a family substance use disorder chronic disease management tool or model. And with that in mind, it is a model that's set up for the financial first, clinical second, and it manages where the two come together. That's where you want us. I know, I know that the idea of, of money, you know, we have to reorient ourselves here. This is also about, it's also about cash, cash flow, cash payment. So, and that's a good thing because it ensures that things get done in the kind of quality, because you're paying for it, that you expect. So with that in mind, I want to thank you for joining us for the first part of a three-part discussion of the Abacus, Family Substance Use Disorder Chronic Disease Management Model. And hopefully this has inspired you to sit there and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to get in touch with Roy. I'm going to email him my thoughts about this. Or I'm a physician or I'm a clinician. I want in on this. I want to join a panel discussion, at, of which we will have many. And, and I want to give Roy my contact information. This is my specialty. This is my interest. I want to go this. We're going to get funding on this. And eventually, I wouldn't be surprised if we started to attach some artificial intelligence. because This is so measurable. We can start to do projection and probability of, of success curves on this also. And that would also indicate recommendations if then go to. So with all of this in mind, it's a very exciting time to be in these three spheres as they co-mingle the addiction treatment, the
the dual diagnosis in mental health, and the comorbidities for medicine. You can reach me at familiesimpactedbyopioids at gmail.com. You can call me at 440-385-7605. I really look forward to this discussion. This, once again, is going to be a real change for this dynamic. And remember, we've been down this path before with HIV AIDS. And look at where they ended up. We can do the same thing and create a manageable society, community, and family experience as it relates to substance use disorders. We just have to modify this so that it's an alternate site healthcare consortium delivery system and not necessarily the system that's in place today. Although, from this disease management design, you can see it uses all the assets that are currently available and they profit from it. And that's good. It's just we're going to manage it better by taking it out of their brick and mortar, come to us and we'll help you, to a different design. We're going to come to you and help you in the place where you are. Once again, my name is Roy Poyan. I am a licensed chemical dependency counselor assistant and certified mental health coach and the director of Families Impacted by Opioids. And I want to thank you for joining us for today's episode of The Voice of the Families in Addiction. Stand up for yourself and I'll back you up Cause problems don't solve themselves I'll tell you what Instead of would or could I think you should draw a line in the sand and stand your ground. It's for your own good.